Hello and welcome to today's Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research Training in Advanced Data Analytics webinar. I'm Elizabeth Genexi, and on behalf of OBSSR, I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar. Before we begin, I'm going to share just a few logistical um, notes for you. First, today's webinar is being recorded. All participants will be muted during the webinar. Questions and comments can be submitted via the Zoom chat feature. You can ask your questions at any time. Just click on the chat, type your questions for everyone to see, and then hit send. We're going to do our best to answer as many questions as possible as we can during the Q&A session. Today, we're delighted to bring to you a wonderful talk called Translating Domain Knowledge into Mechanistic Process Models, Illustrating the Need for a Just-in-Time Adaptive Intervention. We have three lecturers here today that will be bringing this program to you. Eric Heckler comes to us from University of California, San Diego. Misha Pavel comes from Northeastern University. And finally, Donna Sprud Metz is going to be a discussant for the panel and help us with the Q&A at the end. And she is at University of Southern California. So uh, with all, not without any further delay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and allow um, Dr. Heckler to share his. All right, thank you so much, Liz. Um, yeah, let me get started. Let's make sure I'm on the right slide before I start. Cool. And all right, can everyone see that? Yes. Yep. All right, great. Thank you so much, um, Liz, for having us here and to give a little talk uh, on translating domain knowledge into process models and uh, illustrating the need with uh, JEDI. And you can see there's lots of people involved in this work um, across many different universities. Um, so just to give a bit of an outline for what we're gonna do, I wanna, we're gonna first start, I'm gonna start with an overview of what we mean by this idea of domain knowledge to behavioral process models. Uh, and you'll notice I'm actually explicitly moving away from the role, the notion of mechanistic. Uh, it's, we can talk about that maybe in the discussion section, but in brief, I'm increasingly thinking we need to think more about how life systems work and not necessarily be bound to how machines work. And I think we often fall into a trap of thinking that we are machines when we're not, just as a note. Uh, and so uh, start with that as an overview. And then I want to get into an ongoing example of this that's actually happening between two uh, NIH grants, one that I'm a uh, lead PI on with uh, Daniel Rivera and uh, Pedro Kloshnia, and as well uh, work uh, another one that um, Donna Sprout-Metz, Pedja Kloshnia, and Ben Marlin are, are PIs, and Misha Pavel is also a co-investigator on that one. Uh, this idea of moving domain knowledge to process models, and then particularly in the, this, um, uh, the one that I'm PI on, developing what we call a system identification experiment. Uh, from that, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Misha, and he's going to give a description and context of the current trends in data science, particularly as this fits into that context. And then last, uh, Donna will bring in and, and facilitate more of a discussion on this, bringing us back into particularly knowing that this is for uh, trainees, kind of discussing what does this mean in terms of training and whatnot, and start to probe some questions there. So. First, I want, and since this is a training, I very much want to sh give a shout out to one of our students, Lisa Gutzian, who is a data science, she actually graduated master's uh, data science student from Germany, who came and did a visiting scholarship work with me right before COVID hit. And so she actually had to leave a month early, sadly, but she still stayed on, she finished her thesis. And actually the computational model that I will be presenting today, Lisa was really the key person who made it. Um, and so I just want to give a big shout out to her. On that, and she is on this call, and she'd be willing to. She's very interested in joining the Q and A. Um, so, so let's start with the problem. The problem is human behavior is complex. I think we all know this, right? But uh, particularly, one way I like to think about this is this idea of uh, three things. One. Um, when we're trying to understand human behavior, it's important to remember that there's often a variety of variables and factors that have an impact on what someone is doing. You know, it's not necessarily just what's going on within the skin. It's also a lot of what's going on outside the skin. I broadly frame this as context matters. Um, with that, <clears throat> another key challenge, of course, is that 
human behavior and behavior change is dynamic. Things are constantly changing within this. And then with these two things, there's a great deal of idiosyncrasy that starts to manifest within different peoples. You know, So in essence, context matters, things change, and therefore people are different. Um, so I think we have a pretty good sense of this being true in the case based on all of our classic work uh, in behavioral science. The question is, is how do we actually meaningfully study and make progress on that level of complexity? Well, uh, what this is basically a model that we're going to just keep coming back to. Uh, I particularly will transition uh, with Misha, where he'll talk through this in more depth. But the key thing that we're trying to highlight is this idea of there's a quite a variety of different things that we need to be doing to really map out and make progress on understanding the complexity of human behavior and behavior change. Um, and you can, and I think uh, the key thing that we're trying to emphasize is that I think classically what we've been really moving towards is this notion of big data and statistical computing as a pathway linked with, of course, assessments uh, and behavioral assessments towards understanding uh, these processes. What we're going to be arguing in this talk is the importance of really taking into account our prior knowledge, our domain knowledge, and uh, po uh, postulating a priori process models that can actually map out that level of complexity and using that to then guide how we engage in both big and small data. Small data is more, you can also think about this as, as another phrase is nomothetic versus ideographic. So nomothetic taking advantage of aggregating across individuals, uh, ideographic, much more of time series looking within uh, individuals. Um, taking advantage of both of those types of data to actually make progress on this work. And so in particular, the, the key goal of, I think that we're really moving towards is this notion, not just of sort of describing if there is a causal inference, a, a causal descriptive model, if you will, but really true causal explanation. And therefore starting to build real trust and understanding of how behavior and behavior change works. So this is the broad model and we'll keep coming back to it. Uh, but just wanted you to kind of see this as a bigger visual as we move forward. So going into a little bit more depth. What do we mean by domain knowledge and particularly moving to process models? So by domain knowledge, we basically just mean our prior knowledge from evidence, from theory, or firsthand observation about a process of change. So you can think, for example, operant conditioning. We have a great deal of work, uh, both practical and theoretical, suggesting it's a very valuable model for helping us understand human behavior and behavior change, right? So then if that's our prior knowledge, if you will, and our domain knowledge, what then is a behavioral process model? What, by this, we mean the translation of that domain knowledge into a mathematical model that encapsulates the prior theorized processes, okay? And so what I wanna try to highlight is why it's so important to really build out these process models. Um, so as an example of this, this is something that Daniel Rivera and our colleagues, uh, our students and whatnot uh, developed together, particularly Bill Riley who was actually the key author on uh, the paper that published this. Um, is basically this is a, um, a dynamical systems model, a mathematical representation of social cognitive theory. Now, this just looks like there's just a bunch of uh, arrows and lines, but there's actually underneath all of this, you can see little, uh, you know, all these key, key pieces of the equation basically built in to this is actually, there's a whole mathematical equation that undergirds this. And from this, we've been using it to develop a, a, a control system. And we have a whole other R01 that uh, I'm not describing at all today, but using this to actually help us to make better informed, uh, personalized and perpetually adapting uh, behavioral interventions. Um, so it, the short summary, and the reason why I bring this up here is saying, I think that there's actually quite a bit of domain knowledge that we have, but I don't think we've I, I don't think we've forced ourselves to get to the level of actually turning them into process models where we're very carefully thinking through the dynamic interrelationships between these things. We get there sometimes with like structural equation models and whatnot, which um, uh, um, Misha will get into. Uh, so if this is the example, why, why is this so important? And particularly, I know Abby's on this call, I saw her name in here. So Abby and I actually wrote a commentary together uh, discussing uh, moving towards open mechanistic science of behavior change. And this was in response to the science of behavior change work, which before I get into it, I'm going to be doing some critiques of it, but I also wanna really highlight, I think there's a lot of brilliance to this. And I think it's really good because I think what it's doing is it's forcing us as a science and a field to really start 
start to think very carefully on, on how we really build a robust and rigorous science. And so I hope, I really do invite you to go to this commentary because Abby and I did hit on a lot of the very good things about the science of behavior change and this line of work. But with that, I also want to highlight some of the, the potentially the limitations of it. And the short summary is basically coming back to the opening point. Behavior change is complex. And, and the short summary is there's a mismatch between the level of complexity that exists compared to the statistical models and the experimentation that's actually uh, taking place more often than not. And so in particular, the general idea of the science of behavior change, as you can see in this, is, is, is bound around the idea of a statistical mediation model, right? There's basically your direct pathway and then your mediated pathway of your mechanism of action, right? And this, by the way, is totally fine as a model if this is actually describing your belief systems on the theory you're trying to test. The problem is, is that, and as uh, Abby and I talked through in depth in this paper, when you looked at all of the uh, 10 papers, there was an incredible amount of subtlety, complexity, if you will, domain knowledge encapsulated in the introductions that were then not actually fully encapsulated in the text tests that we're doing. But again, and I again, invite you to look at the commentary, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, again, I actually think there's great strength in allowing us to make progress on doing rigorous experimentation to help us to start to get towards these questions of what are actually these processes of change that we're driving for. The issue is if it's more complex uh, than the methods, we're not gonna feasibly be able to study that. Right? And you can see this even with, you can see Alex Rothman, who I'm a big fan of. I actually invited, I wanted to make sure Alex was here because I wanted to talk to him about this. Um, Alex um, has been uh, with Pascal Scheer and has been uh, trying to extend this logic, really trying to think about like, how do we take into account context? And so he has this interesting paper that called the Operating Conditions Framework. Oh, and I realized I still have the webinar. This is now Impress. Um, I can send that link later of the actual Impress paper. Um, but the general idea here is, it's continuing these notions that we have from statistics, where what we're going to do to try to understand and take advantage of and take into account context, coming back to that opening statement that context matters, is that we use moderation, particularly moderated mediation. Um, and you can see this in terms of this engagement moderation, validity moderation in terms of the mediated pathway. Now, again, there's, there, I think there are actually are very good reasons for doing this if it makes sense with the, the basic fundamental properties of the phenomenon we're studying. The issue is, is again, what if the, it's more complex than these methods allow us to work on? So, and let me illustrate what do I mean by that in terms of how that, when that might happen. This is particularly becomes uh, more obvious when we start thinking about what we're calling JEDIs or just-in-time adaptive interventions. So here's the basic idea. We, what we're trying to do, this is from an, an NIH uh, R01 that Pedro Kloshny was PI on that I was a co-investigator on that has been used to help uh, move forward these other projects moving forward, right? But the general idea is we're sending these little uh, cues to action, these context cues, uh, to nudge someone to go for a walk. So you can see the general nudge is how about taking a few minutes to enjoy nature? Right, um, and the idea is that we send these multiple times throughout the day, and using a microanimization trial, um, what we're going to be studying is if those notifications seem to have an impact in different contexts. But let's just try to think through like the fundamental phenomenon. What's going on with this, right? Like, if you send a notification like this, there's quite a few things that really need to happen to get that little context cue to actually get someone to engage in a walk. Right? They need to read it. They need to be appreciate the prompt. They probably need to feel capable. And then from that, they might decide to act or not on that behavior in that moment, which then, of course, might result in them walking in 10 minutes or not. And then, of course, though, also, if we think about this, these things would then be recursive, right? So that, you know, if someone decides to act now or, or later, that's going to influence, influence the future response, right? Like if we keep sending these notifications at very bad times, you're get, they're going to be start to be ignored, right? Because people are just not going to necessarily see that this notification is being useful for them. Right. Um, and then last but not least, context can also really matter within this and have an impact on all of this. Right. So the opportunity to go for a walk, right, depending on how much opportunity that a person might have or how stressed they are or if other people are present or not. Right. This might all set up not in a deterministic way, but more in a probabilistic way, the probability with which this text message would result in someone going for a walk or not. Right. And so this is basically just getting into the idea, again, that context matters things change and therefore people are different. It's getting into these momentary responses of how do we know causally if this thing is producing the desired effects? 
Now, pushing this forward, this actually gets us to need to think very carefully about our notions of causality within the work, and then thinking about building methods and processes that can handle the level of causality that we, we think is going on, right? And so I particularly want to bring up this notion of Innis conditions. This is from J.L. Mackey. Uh, the general idea is that you want to be thinking about causality in terms of things that are insufficient but necessary, parts of a condition which uh, itself is unnecessary but sufficient. Okay, now I'm sure that makes no sense to anyone. Let me put it back into the context of this, of what I just described. The insufficient but necessary part, this is basically the idea of recognizing that there's preconditions. Or you can think about this in terms of saying context matters causally, right? Now, now particularly with these little notifications, I think this can become very obvious, right? It's like, there's gonna be times and places when if you send this notification, in certain contexts, it'll work just fine. People will go for a walk, right? If they, if it's really easy for them to go for a walk, if they're feeling like either low stressed and they're like, yeah, a walk would be a great thing, right? Or if they wanna go for a walk with someone and someone's present, right? Like all of those are preconditions that, that actually set up the, even the possibility that this context cue could causally result in someone going for a walk, right? So on one side of this, there's basically these propensities. And notice this isn't fully deterministic. This is probabilistic, right? There's certain states when a person will engage in walking versus not. And so causally, context really matters. And we can't just average it out, which is what we classically do with randomization uh, in, uh, in a lot of our, our works and formalisms. Right? But then the second thing is there's going to be a mechanism of action. Right? And so what we're striving for is getting someone to go for a walk here. Right? Now, this is uh, the reason why this is unnecessary but sufficient. The idea here is, is that, um, that this app, of course, is one way to potentially get someone to go for a walk. But there are many ways to get someone to go for a walk. Right? They might just have an internalized feeling of an urge to go for a walk. Right? That could be a cue to action. A friend could walk by and say, hey, you want to go for a walk? Right, that's a cue to action. You know, it's all of these are different uh, operationalizations of this underlying thing, which is getting a cue or a trigger to act. Okay, and so we need to be very careful when we're doing our calls of work on making sure we're not we're being very have this distinction between the concrete implementation, this specific cue, versus the thing we're trying to activate, which is this cue to action. Okay, so that's the level of complexity that I think we're really starting to think about. And with technology, I think we can really start engaging, particularly with these data science methods that we're talking about. Right? So, and linking this back to kind of more older formal, not older, but I think some classic formalisms of causality that we use in behavioral science, right? I want to go back to Shadish, Cook, and Campbell, and in particular, their notion of causal descriptive versus causal explanatory models, right? And the way you can think about causal descriptive models, it's basically like what you can do is imagine you're running an experiment, and what you do is you randomize flipping a light switch on or off a thousand times. And as you flick the switch, you see that the light bulb turns on, right? And a lot, this is very much like our randomized controlled trials. It basically tells us if there's an effect, Right? But what it does not tell us is how that effect happened. Right, That's a causal explanatory model in the way they frame it. Right, And so a causal explanatory model is rather than trying to understand just if I flick this switch, I get an effect, it's actually understanding how does that happen. Right, When I close this switch, there was, a, there was water that was falling over and that uh, spun a generator and electricity was generated from that. It flew through all these wires. Right, When I closed the switch, I closed this circuit that allowed electricity to flow up into a light bulb. The light bulb has a tungsten filament within it it and within that that produces uh, resistance which produces light right that's a causal explanatory model what we're trying to get to with this type of work is actually formulating these causal explanatory models uh, and then thinking about how we actually do experimentation to study those causal explanatory models okay so with that how do we study this if that's the problem then how do we actually make progress on that and now I'm, I'm moving into the concrete um, version of this. So first, coming back to that uh, hard step study. So this is that exact same context cues, things that I showed you. What we saw in the hard step study, that's what the study was called, was these two interesting dynamics. On the one hand, whenever we were sending these notifications over the six week period, what we were finding is a decreasing proximal effect. So each time we sent a notification, it seemed to result in people walking less after each one of those notifications. But simultaneously, we saw that there seemed to be this, like if you look at this at a daily level, so this is like within day, like within a, like 30 minutes after getting each notification, the effects are going down. But simultaneously, we were noticing there was this sort of like a gradual increase in total steps. And so what we were thinking is, is like that what this might mean is that there is, people are basically starting to not respond well to the notifications, but they seem to maybe 
be internalizing what the notification is, right? There's that, that, that cue to action, that mechanism of action might be internalized outside of the app itself, right? And so uh, you can see there's sort of this, yeah, and I just kind of talked through that, right? And then here's one last thing. There, there might be this sort of auto recovery observed because what we were finding is if we didn't send too many notifications, so less than two a day, it seemed to be more effect efficacious even later on in the trial. So with this as sort of the empirical observations that we started thinking about, we started thinking, well, how do we actually build a model to understand that complexity? And so we started by thinking about three latent mechanisms. So this is all just simulation, just to be clear. We were just trying to get our clear sense. This is the idea of moving from prior knowledge and domain knowledge into process models, right? So the first step is just sort of thinking, what do we think we're going to see, right? Based on, on what might be a meaningful latent explanation for what we're seeing in observed data, right? So the first thing we thought about was this notion of auto recovery. And you can think about this until also in terms of just sort of receptivity to receiving a notification. Right. The general idea here is much like a neuron, right? If you keep sending uh, uh, notifications, people are just going to start ignoring them. They're, they're basically getting overwhelmed, right? But if you think, if you pay more attention and be more careful about it, there's going to be this sort of auto recovery such that people are going to be more receptive to receiving support if you don't bug them too much, basically. You know, and so this is sort of a general pattern you can see here. And notice the red triangle is basically whenever an, an, an intervention was sent. And I also want you to notice this is in hours. Now we're going into days. Then the notion would be thinking about an intervention. Every time you send a notification, the perceived value someone might get from that intervention is likely to diminish, right? Like the first time you get it, then this is another way of trying to specify the notion of a novelty effect, right? Like the first time you get a notification is very new. You're going to get a lot of the benefit from it by the, you know, the, 10th or 20th time that you're receiving the notification, there's maybe a lot less that's actually functionally you're getting from that, right? And so the value compared to the burden it places on you to actually just read it and engage diminishes, hence, hence this sort of pathway. The last latent construct we were thinking about is internalization. Right. So the idea here, and this is ultimately, this is the good stuff. This is basically what we want, right? What we want to have happen is we want to see this idea of we're sending these notifications and eventually something internalized behavioral process is driving the change. This is what we mean by this latent construct of internalization, such that they're building an internalized sense of the knowledge, skills, and practices that, that would have the person engage in the behavior regardless of if the intervention were present or not. Right. And so, but with this, we think we could maybe conceptualize what we were starting to see observing in those data and also help us to really build more robust behavioral interventions. And so I want to then say we were talking about domain knowledge, right? So there's a lot that we built on, but I, and I also want to make sure we have time for Misha. So I'm going to go a little bit quicker through these last these sets of slides because I think you guys know this, right? But first, we basically built on operant learning. So we particularly build on animal models around habituation to a stimulus, and then also positive reinforcement uh, for building uh, up the model. And these are visualizations, but there's math underneath all of this, which I'll show you in a moment. And again, this is what Lisa uh, developed with us, right? Another key set of domain knowledge we build on was cognitive science related to decision making, right? And so there are these models that help us to understand how someone makes a decision. It's so basically the stuff going on within their brain, but also how context can have an impact on it, which translated into building out this idea of a utility function for walking, and then ultimately turning this into a, um, you know, a, um, a binary decision on if they will go for a walk or not. Um, and then, and ultimately what we did, there's a few more things because you notice we actually had different time scales. So then we also encapsulated time scales with this. Uh, and what you can see here is we have the little orange here. This is basically getting at that, what I showed you earlier, that, that uh, empirical observation of this diminishing intervention effect. That's now being sort of conceptually described in the model here. And then the sort of reinforcement, the internalization is happening with this little loop back into this notion of attitudes towards walking. Or you could also think about this as sort of the key bucket where internalization happens, if you will. Right. And as I said, that's just a pretty visual. There's actually a great deal of math underneath this, where we're actually accounting for this idea of, of there being different states and, and, and taking that more state space formalism. So there's quite a few nonlinearities in this model. Uh, you can also see the aspects in green that are related to this notion of internalization. There's also, also multiple timescales that we're taking into account uh, within this model. Okay. So, and the interesting thing when you start building processes models is you can then run simulations. You can basically do a sanity check. Like, again, this is not telling us that the model is true. 
what it's telling us is that the math is doing what we hope it does. And the short summary is it is, right? When, we're, when we run simulations where we send like cues to action within the math is simulation environment, we're, we're getting this simulated response of this auto recovery. We're also, if we get the timing just right, we actually start to build this sort of internalized um, sense of growth towards walking. Okay. Um, and now this is sort of a summary of all the different things in the, in the references where we pulled the domain knowledge and prior knowledge from. I don't have time to get into all of these, but I just wanted to highlight this idea that there's actually quite a bit of domain knowledge encapsulated in this process model. And notice the process model is not forcing us to simply Simplify our experimentation, coming back to science of behavior change. It's, it's, a, it's, a for, it's allowing us to basically engage with the level of complexity. And as we thought through all of this, you can see this one, primary focus of the experiment. The key thing that we really started thinking about is like, okay, well, it seems like the stuff that matters most for behavioral science is building this internalized sense of behavior and behavior change. Hence why I'm really highlighting that. And so that became the thing that we wanted to study within a system identification experiment. So how do you do this? And what is system identification? System identification focuses on modeling of these dynamical systems from data, okay? And so it's focused on estimating and validating the model to describe the system. And this is the key thing. It is not focused on effect size estimates of intervention components. So the science, like all of the work that we classically do around experimentation, it's built around these statistical notions of a cause and effect of an intervention produces an outcome. Right, which to me is gets us into the sort of thinking of humans as a machine, right? But what we're actually trying to do is study or, by, or coming back to Schottish, Cook, and Cam Campbell's language, it allows us to produce causal uh, descriptive models. But, but what if we're trying to study the causal explanatory models? In brief, system identification is a way to do that. And so I want to show you this as an example, and then I'll show you the model, the one that we're just in the midst of developing for our R1, and then I'll pass over to uh, Misha. But this is one that Daniel Rivera and I and our, and our students had developed in the past. The general idea here was we were trying to get people to engage in increased physical activity. And so we tried to build a very basic operant conditioning feedback loop. And this was actually the, the system identification experiment that we designed to help us to start to unpack the social cognitive theory, particularly starting with an operant conditioning loop, basically. Um, and so what we did was, we, this is the key experimentation. We were basically trying to figure out and randomize, you actually technically pseudo randomize, delivery of people engaging in ambitious but doable goals. And so what we did was, on some days, we gave people really high goals. On some days, we got, gave people really low goals, and sometimes somewhere in between. So this was experimentally randomized a priori, and it was set up relative to their levels of steps. So their baseline mediums of steps defined what the range would be so that we're not going into crazy ranges for them. So that's, if you will, the cue, the stimulus, if you will, of the operant conditioning loop. We also then told people if they engaged in walking and they met their goals, they would receive points, which translated into gift cards, basically 500 points equal to dollar in this, right? And so sometimes it gave people high points and low points. These two signals were completely orthogonal, uh, designed a priori that way. Um, and then what we also did was, of course, gathered data. So we gathered how often we actually gave them the goals. Uh, when they met their goals and therefore received their points. And we also gathered contextual data such as weekend or weekday. We also gathered process data like self-efficacy and whatnot. And what you can see is with this, the, what that we built and validated was a model that was actually meaningfully predictive for each individual person, their response. And I forgot to say that this is all ideographic in nature. Uh, this, so this is this is you doing and doing deep studies of time series within each person. Um, and so you can see here is the little pink line. This is what the model is actually predicting and seek and explain, explain about 25% of a person's variance. The black line is, is the steps that they actually took. So you can see it's actually doing a pretty darn good job to help us to understand that. And, and you might think I cherry picked this. I didn't go to the papers to see uh, more details about this. Okay, so last but not least for me, and then I'm passing over to, to um, Misha, is a shout out to Mohammed who is another one of our students, who was the key person, Daniel Rivera's student, who has been developing the system identification experiment that we're now doing to work through and validate the model that I showed you that Lisa developed. You know? And so the basic proposed idea is what we want to do is our primary aim is to test the dynamic hypothesis that just-in-time messaging will result in meaningful accumulative behavior. So that sort of idea of Basically, the, the key notion that we learned from our simulations from Lisa's model was this idea that if we get the timing just right, we should be able to facilitate meaningful accumulation of behavior change, that internalization notion, right? And so that's basically what we're trying to test. So basically, timing really matters, is the short summary statement. But of course, 
Uh, we also had the secondary, and we're not exactly sure how best to define just in time. Uh, you know, and so we have this notion where we want to take into account: do they actually need it? Right. Basically, if like if you're meeting your goals, we shouldn't probably bar bother you that much, right? Um, and do you have the opportunity to walk? Are we paying attention to something like your calendar data, or you know how often you seem to be walking based on your steps data, right? And then are you receptive, basically paying attention to, since we know we had this notion of uh, auto recovery, we're going to pay attention to how many not times we bugged you and not bug you too much, right? And build that into how we send messages. So what this results in is, and I don't have time to get into all the depths of system ID, but the, the short summary of it is what we're doing is we're building signals just like that one I just described, but actually studying the just-in-time state. And the key thing you'll notice is we actually have 16 days where we are going to be just doing the way that we think is just-in-time responses. Why? Because the hypothesis we have is, is not related to one single outcome. It's actually related to the accumulation of getting timing right. You know, and so we actually need some several days to see that. But then we also want to honestly overburden people. And that's where this is coming in, where we actually try to do some experimentation on our if then states. But more often than not, we might just honestly um, build out and just do full randomization, which we're based on our heart subsidy. We're pretty sure we'll bother people too much. But then you'll also notice we built in a recovery time to basically account for the fact that we think there's going to be um, this auto recovery response. Now, this is, of course, all hypothetical, right? What we're going to be doing is using all the different computational modeling that we can to actually meaningfully study this. And as you can see, time matters a lot. And so this is actually a very long experiment. And each one of these is ideographic. We, each, we treat each person as their own experiment. And so this actually lasts 252 days, the experiment that we're uh, advancing right now and building the technology to support. But with this, we think now, coming back to this model, and I'm going to transition now to Misha, what we're doing is we very clearly specify domain knowledge into process models, and we're developing using the tools from uh, system identification from control systems engineering, a small data plus statistical computation approach to actually study that process model. And with that, I'm going to now transition over to uh, uh, Misha for the next steps. Mute it. Um, so uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, this was quite a bit of uh, information. So I'm going to uh, get a little bit under the hood uh, and uh, sort of put it in, fra in the framework of uh, what's going on with uh, data science, machine learning, and AI. The, uh, the idea uh, shown on the next slide of machine learning is actually revolutionary and in some ways. In fact, um, it's based on uh, using large amounts of data, developing or using models that are agnostic to the processes that generate the data, and then come up with predictions by optimizing the average performance. Now, um, this works wonderfully. And uh, there are packages that anybody can use without any thinking. And uh, that, that created a lot of excitement in the field. In fact, uh, Christopher Anderson, who used to be uh, the chief editor of Wired, at one point said that uh, you no longer need theories. Uh, it, big data is going to solve everything. So. The problem, uh, uh, at first, it seemed to work very well. But uh, uh, people who actually use it in serious situations are, re are recognizing uh, shortcomings that uh, are, on the next slide, uh, identify with the red line, red, the red ellipse. The problem is that um, these models require a huge amount of label data. That's hard to combine. But the worst situation, is, worst thing is that these models are optimized on the basis of average performance. So if you have a lot of training data, the average of the data is, is doing very well. But when you are at the edges, as shown on, on the slide here, uh, you're likely to not do well. And we have a problem in healthcare or military or uh, flight uh, design 
when you have to make a decision about individuals and how well do you know how well that individual was um, was served by this model that's not based on the process or any knowledge about what's going on. And I th then this is what we are trying to do. So if we move forward, I'm going to give you an example of how we are actually going to use domain knowledge or how we are actually have been using domain knowledge to develop models that combine data and could be small data for individuals, relatively speaking, to find explanations. And when we say causal explanation, as Derek mentioned, uh, we don't necessarily mean the statistical sense of causality, that there are no confounders, but causal in a sense of generation of the data by a process, like um, the, uh, the stimulus response models that, and uh, learning models that Eric mentioned before. Once we have that kind of model, we can develop a trust in that model. It's not just explanation of which variable is important, but how that variable actually generates those results. Because when you wanna intervene and find out cure for a particular individual who is ailing from particular disease, you don't wanna give them average uh, treatment. And this is what's happening right now. Now, using this uh, mechanistic or process models, um, we can uh, develop better assessments and predictions. On the next slide, I'm going to go through some simple example. Now, this is completely, of course, this is not new. We have been using this for years in psychology, right? So structural equations models, which are some generalizations of, uh, of conformal uh, conformational uh, factor analysis is an example. What you, what you, what this example uh, consists of is uh, uh, developing a linear model that uh, uses regression to estimate uh, whatever in, uh, variables you are interested in, including latent variables. Now. This has been used very, very well in psychology and other fields. But the problem is that these approaches have been mostly static. So in response to that, people started developing what they call dynamic structural equation models, where you actually can express the change in the state of individuals as a result of interventions or are just general uh, life situations. And that's shown on the slide on the equation below. Now, uh, on the next slide, I think uh, we uh, identify the uh, dependence on time. Now, this is a uh, sort of a half funny babies, baby model because um, I have been uh, taking care of a five months old uh, child <laughs> recently. And I, of course I need to have a model in order to know when to change the baby. And uh, I have uh, developed this model of three states, uh, three variables. Uh, one is the, my interaction with the, with the baby, uh, baby's internalization of of her competency and then her actions. And uh, this is not a very complex model, but a uh, uh, dynamic uh, structure equation model seem to, seem to work for this. Uh, as you see, uh, we, we have uh, two variables. So, so we are uh, uh, expressing it linear, uh, in terms of linear equations that are just as a shorthand expressed as the matrices, which are then shown on the top. I, I wish I had a pointer I could uh, point you, but if you go to the next uh, slide, I'll show you how, the, how I converted that, how I needed to convert it to dynamical structural equations. And again, all I added was adding temporal dependency. So it's still structural equations, but temporal dependencies. Now, 
this is this makes it interesting because it enables us to follow evolution of of the states of the of the baby over time and again we use uh, uh, linear equations for that now the next uh, next uh, slide shows that this dynamic structure equation model is actually what in statistical as signal processing we call ARX model the autoregressive models. And what it, what it is, is just same representation as these dynamical structure equations that then uh, are able to make predictions over time. As you see, the time on, on, the, uh, on the variables is equal, it depends on the inputs and on the time that variable was had value before in previous sample. Now, uh, the ARX model actually is equivalent to many state space dynamic models, which engineers used to compute anything from uh, 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 radios and telephones to aeroplanes. And uh, the only difference that is that the engineer Engineers like to use a square uh, connect square arrows rather than round arrows. So on the next slide, I am going to show you the general approach that uh, and identify certain very fundamental differences. So first of all, we still use the label data as much as possible, right? But because we have the principles, hypothesis and purple and some population results, we can represent our models in a way that the models actually incorporate constraints that are associated with the underlying processes. So Eric's models on reinforcement learning that he presented before slightly uh, uh, in, in previous slides is an example of actual a uh, changing of state of individual as a function of inputs and their behavior. Now, you notice that this, what we are now using to, to model the uh, behaviors incorporates these processes. That makes a huge difference in our ability to identify the actual causes of changes in states of individuals. And because of that, we will be able to then intervene in a more appropriate way. Now, of course, these models are not perfect and uh, uh, they are hard to build and uh, Dana will make that point very clearly. They require knowledge of the process, at least to some extent, but they also identify an important uh, need for being incorporating context explicitly into the models. Of course, any kind of uh, models flaws can lead to biased results, but that, that can be actually expressed and measured and assessed and the model can be improved. In the next slide, I'm going to uh, just summarize this. And of course, as you may imagine, I was trying to summarize uh, perhaps two semester class in, in about 10 minutes. So the, I wasn't, wouldn't be surprised if you were slightly confused, but just to give you the uh, summary of the benefits, the, um, the, what I didn't mention is that by having process models, you can use the data much more efficiently in terms of statistics because the parameters of the models that we come up with actually represent process. And because of that, we have many fewer parameters in order to characterize the, uh, the uh, input output relationships or the state changes. We can generalize to individuals by just adjusting few few of the parameters that uh, can be characterizing the differences between individuals. And as a re result of that, we can 
we know what kind of data we need to collect, much better than if we just randomly collect data. And most importantly, it, these, by building these models, we actually improving the science underlying because they provide us with opportunity to not only optimize interventions, but actually test the theories in a much better way than previously, because we have a rigorous representation of the theory. And the next slide, I'm going to give you a little bit of a switch. Next slide. This is an example. I, I'm just rushing through because of timing. Uh, as you, those of you who are interested in behaviors and, and the behavioral uh, representation, realize that there are many uh, different models. Now, are they different models? Are they fundamentally different models? How would you know? How would you actually test it? So previously, I went through three models that were equivalent. It was the dynamic structural equations, autoregressive models in statistics, and state space linear models in, in, in engineering. They I showed by real concrete representation of those models, we were able to show that they are equivalent in many ways. They have slight differences, but they are generally equivalent. Now, could you uh, uh, would you say that these models are very different? So trans theoretical models based on these states, discrete states, self-determination so the theory has a slightly different representation of what the social cognitive theories concept and latent variables are. Would they be really different or would it be the case that if we convert them to, to a real rigorous uh, mathematical representation, they would actually be represented by the same states and same state changes and slightly different measurement models. Anyway, to answer these questions, you absolutely need to develop rigorous mathematical computational models of these, uh, of these uh, theoretical concepts. And uh, I think I'm um, uh, going to finish, next slide. just by giving you a, a little summary of the kind of tools and methods that we use for this process modeling or mechanistic modeling. The first step that you will need to uh, consider is very rigorous definition of what you mean by input, output, and the different variables. Are these variables discrete or continuous? Do you have discrete states, you think? Well, that's... If we do think that, we are represented by discrete and see where it goes. Uh, even just uh, thinking about the uh, boundedness of, of these variables, are they from zero to infinity? Are they negative, positive? Makes huge difference in way of representing it. This will allow us to actually differentiate between models if they are different and show equivalences if they are equivalent. Another part is rigorous definition of uncertainty. And even in engineering, we often put uncertainty at the end as an error term. And that's what we do with the structural equations and a lot of, uh, lot of uh, uh, psychological models. But there are some aspects that are inherently random of the decision-making, for example. And how are these random variables uh, influenced by other things like context, environment, and so on. There are multiple uh, modeling frameworks. I didn't have chance to talk about the multi-scale, uh, the fact that there are many, many scales, both temporal and uh, structural, that need to be incorporated. So we didn't talk about the social influence as much, which actually would require a network type of models and agent-based models. The, uh, uh, the difference between dynamical Bayesian models and state representation is a very important uh, uh, to understand because there are some equivalences, but uh, there are fundamental differences as well. So. 
uh, there are many, many uh, tools that we can use and uh, we are just beginning on this journey. So stick with us. So uh, this is this is the Q&A period. Please ask your questions. Sarah, you had a, Sarah Curran had a really interesting thought and I'm going to talk to exactly what you say in the chat. This work is really hard. We are not trained to think like this. And each discipline that we bring in thinks of complexity, complexity differently and has different priorities and often different definitions for the same variables or for the same ideas. But it takes really a lot of different disciplines working together to make this work. Given the longitudinal, temporally dense, highly individualized data sets that we have, what kind, this kind of modeling and what kind of modeling can let us talk about how stuff works? This has really given us the chance for the first time in history in a way to really look at the processes. But it's hard, as I said before, and it takes a large group of people getting together and really talking it through. Um, Eric, next slide. However, it's really rewarding. We get to look under the hood at complex dynamic human behavior in real time and in real context. Next slide. So I wanted to ask you guys a couple of questions to sort of stimulate your questions to us. I was wondering if anyone here is doing this kind of modeling work or trying to think about process in a way that help would help with intervening in real time. So. I'm interested in the audience, in what, what's going on out there. Who have we got here in all of our little black boxes? So please let us know. And also what kind of issues in your own work might, might this kind of approach be useful for or change the way that you're working? And what kind of help would you need to get started if you were interested in this kind of thing? So we have a question. Oh, hi, Angela, so nice that you're here. Um, can you comment on where you might see this work going or playing out further down the transitional pipeline in intervention science? That's one question. Also seems like much of this work depends on sensing technology. To Sarah's question, can we use perception, can we sense perception of context? Um, I am gonna add, I'm gonna answer the second part of it and I'd like to hand the first part of it over to Eric. So Eric, you wanna go ahead and comment on where you might see this work going or playing out further down the transitional, translational pipeline in intervention science? And I'll, I'll grab the second part. Sure, yeah, on the implementation science piece, I think that is such a cool question. Um, something that I, you know, Peja and I uh, in particular have been thinking a lot about is how, like, how do we basically do this sort of process science in real world context and at those scales? So I think a lot of times within implementation science, when we start putting on that hat, we're starting to think a lot more deeply about how context matters. And then even getting into like using hybrid clinical trials, right? Like we're actually balancing efficacy goals with also implementation goals, right? Those can be part of the things that you postulate within these models. And you can also, just to be clear, when I use the phrase small data, I think of an, <clears throat> it's an N of one unit that unit doesn't have to be a person. That person could be a clinic or that unit could be a clinic. That unit could be a city. It could be a region, right? It's more about using data and time series from a, a group for whom you're trying to help to uh, actually make progress on that. And so these, these models can be used to help to map out and understand those complexities. And actually there's quite a bit of interesting work when you start still doing the same sort of work. But as Misha said, you tend to get more into like agent-based modeling and network modeling because you need to understand how like the interstitial space between agents, that's, that's your unit of analysis actually that network. So it, it changes like the, the type of analyses you're doing but the underlying processes are very similar. Uh, and I think there's actually quite a bit you can do working from that space uh, to work through that. Um, and I can send some references later, uh, I think, to kind of unpack that a bit more. I just know we have lots of questions, so I won't go too much more in depth. Um, let me just address really quickly uh, to Sarah's question. Um, it seems like much of this work depends on sensing technology. Can we sense perception? Okay. I And this is why it takes behavioral scientists, engineers, all sorts of different people. 
you know, you cannot yet sense a stomach ache. You still have to ask people, but it's how you ask, when you ask, and if people are open to the question and, and have the right tools to answer it. And so it is, sensing has to be continuously um, shared out with other ways of knowing or perceiving. And then there's also the fact that as we get better in sensing, we'll be able to sense some of these things like what is salient in your environment. That's something that we're working on with Peja and Eric and Misha and Ben and, and Daniel to try and see if we could take traces from other things that we're sensing and stuff that goes on on the phone to understand what, what, say, what is salient in an environment for some, somebody. So I think that there's more than one answer to that question. Can I and, add some? And oh. Misha, please do. Okay, so you're absolutely right. The better you have data you get, the better models you can build, the better predictions you can make and pick better assessment. What we didn't mention is that every sensing aspect has an actually model within that sensing. You have some latent variables, even in physiology. You, you would like to know the blood pressure. You would like to know the uh, state of the brain, but you cannot measure it directly. You can measure EEG, you can measure heart rate, you can measure uh, electrodermal activity, but, and you can ask questions, but how people answer a question requires modeling to some extent, okay? And that's very important to understand. And I, I, I'm really glad that you asked this question because one of the important thing is when people measure, say self-efficacy or something of that sort and provide two different questionnaires, are they exactly identical? Are they, are they equivalent? How do you transform one to the other? How do you incorporate uncertainty into these answers that uh, Dana mentioned? Non-trivial, we have lots of work to do, but it is essential that we do it in a rigorous way. That's a great answer, Misha. Um, there's another question here from, Eliz from Elizabeth. Uh, many of our behavioral and cognitive theories were developed based on average effects across groups of people. Oh, yes. Now, <laughs> with the longitudinal data on individuals over time, you see this as an opportunity to revise or redo our theories. I'm going to give you a very complex answer on this, Liz. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to add to that? It really <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can unpack your answer. <laughs> yeah, and our, our, our folks are not so um, good at that, or at least um, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't see lots of groundbreaking pa uh, papers that say, we're going to completely redo our cognitive behavioral theories in such a way. So I think this opens up uh, an opportunity of a new era for behavioral uh, scientists, um, for sure. And maybe and I, if I can I, jump in to unpack it. Oh, no, sure. Just really quickly, I don't think we're going to redo cog social cognitive models. I think we're going to blow them up. So I don't think that's the right premise. Okay, back to Eric. <laughs> yeah, and, and in my mind, the key, a key notion is, is this idea of a skeuomorph. It's basically this idea of technologies of the past influencing future technologies. And you, know, you can see it in the iPhone, like remember when you're that old page turn thing, like there's no reason for a page turn to exist in the digital screen. Uh, and there's many, many more examples of that. But um, the reason why I say that is I think that you can think of our theories as technologies of the past influencing our future technologies. And so they're in some sense skeuomorphs. We have these notions and these conceptualizations, which is what I was getting at. Um, and I see Alex had something in the, in the chat, so I, I particularly want to hear from him. So, but like having these notions of like, we have these ways that we've previously thought, but now that we have new tools, technologies, resources, methods, and we're having these new partnerships with different re, uh, uh, methods, it opens us up to actually think differently and conceptualize. So for me, increasingly, I actually find it easier to think this way than to think in the way that I was originally trained um, because I, it just because it actually allows me to just think in the level of complexity that I think makes sense for the behavioral phenomenon. 
did it take me a while to get there? Heck yeah. <laughs> but but uh, so to me, it's much more of a problem of unlearning than it is of actually working through this complexity. In my mind, I, like whenever someone says, oh, that's too abstract, I reframe that to say, oh, this is just different for you, right? Because most things are actually abstract. You've just built a praxis underneath that abstraction to make it concrete for you. You don't have a praxis for this. And so therefore it feels abstract. But just what you're doing is just as abstract as this. It's just, you don't have that background to do it. Yeah. Really quick. I think we're running out of I, I time, just, Misha, because I want you to I just Alex. Yeah, just just one more one more thing about the complexity. It's it's a grain of modeling that's a problem in any science whatsoever. In physics, phys, uh, physics laws of a gas does not do not model each molecule, right? And so the correct uh, complexity and correct summarization and and uh, and predictions is based on the questions that you ask. So it's a very good question, a very important decision to make. Is this, you were answering um, Alexander uh, uh, Rothman's question, right? Yes, yes. Very good. The answer. complexity. Yes, it's the complexity that matters and that dictates. And I think that we're at time, right, Liz? Yes, and I think that is a wonderful, actually a wonderful segue to uh, finish on because that's why we're all here. If this was easy, we wouldn't need um, all of these great minds and we wouldn't need to have created a wonderful training program to help the scientists of the future grapple with complexity. And I really appreciate this was a phenomenal talk, Eric, Misha, Donna, thank you so much. And I wanna remind everyone that we are recording and we should have this uploaded, probably been a, about a week or two and I'll shoot an email out to everybody to let you know when it's ready and you can share it with all your friends. And we will be doing our next webinar um, in May. So, um, and that talk will be coming to us from our colleagues at Emory University, uh, Hannah Cooper and Lance Waller are gonna do a great talk and we'll shoot out the details of that soon as well. So with that, thanks again from uh, the National Institutes of Health and the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. Goodbye. <laughs>